Today's video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Prepare yourselves because we're about to dive into a world that'll change the way you play games forever. We're talking about something bigger, bolder, and more epic than ever before. Raid Shadow Legends is the ultimate RPG experience with incredible graphics, intense gameplay, and over 700 unique customizable champions. The current big baddie of the game is Hydra, with its six heads, each one a complete boss battle all on its own. The Head of Blight is a poisonous foe that'll try to infect you with its deadly toxins. The Head of Torment constantly uses true fear to crush the opposition. The Head of Mischief will steal champions' power and use it against them. The Head of Wrath deals severe damage by using pure brute force. The Head of Decay will weaken your attacks while protecting the other Hydra heads. The Head of Suffering is Hydra's main head. Your champion can't attack it without suffering themselves. For newcomers, you can get your hands on the Stag Knight, an epic champion, with a special skin for the Stag Knight designed by JonTron. Just use the code JTSKIN before October 7th. It's as easy as that. If you're a returning player, you can still get the Stag Knight and the skin through an in-game event. Fight the Hydra and other rival clans at the same time in a Hydra Clash, a new clan-based competition where you and four other clans face off against the dreaded Hydra to see who can best bring down the beast, then bask in the spoils of war. As a fan of the classic fantasy RPGs from the 90s, it's refreshing to see a modern take on the genre that gives you more options and also has some stellar graphics. I can tell you for a fact, they didn't have visuals like this back in 1998. And also, who remembers this? Yeah, we all have nostalgia for older games, but I think we forget how much of a pain in the ass they were to run sometimes. With all of this exciting new stuff coming to Raid, you won't want to miss out. So use my link in the description, or scan the QR code you see on screen now, and you'll get insane bonuses including the epic champion, Knight Errant from the Banner Lords faction, and other useful things such as energy refills, skill tome, and XP boosters. Play Raid Shadow Legends today, and I'll see you on the battlefield. Part 1 Every sunrise brings with it a new kind of fire. Father Ramon Castillo remembered the dying words of his father 35 years after the old man had choked on his last breath. It wasn't the first time he'd chanted that proclamation. When Ramon was in high school in the 1980s, his family had taken up arms against the Peruvian government with an enraged torrent of radical militants who saw themselves as revolutionaries looking to overthrow what they saw as the rise of imperialistic practices in their homeland. Every sunrise renews our cause and reignites our fire. He would preach to his family as he hid their smuggled rifles underneath the kitchen floorboards. It was his solemn creed, his unfounded mantra. The words that convinced him that passion and commitment were all that were ever needed to rise above and win the day. As long as a man has fire within him, he will reduce his enemies to ash. Every new day we live sees to reaffirm our fight is just. The memory echoed painfully in Ramon's head like the shriek of a smoke alarm as he watched the dawn bloom into multiple vibrant colors, remembering the pitiful legacy of a man he'd long since outlived. Man is not a vessel for fire, Dad. He whispered bitterly as Hamlet would to the stubborn ghost that dogged him. Only a vessel for toxins, pus, and poison. As the secretly agnostic and very hungover Ramon climbed the church steps, he removed his brass keychain from his pocket. The rattling of his keys sparked the memory of shell casings cascading across the floor as his father held his ground against automatic weapons fire while he and his siblings cowered behind the couch in the next room. The man had died proclaiming an imagined victory, 
convinced he would stand up to witness another sunrise and revive the inferno that fueled his heart and soul. God did exist. It was only to watch us all burn under the magnifying glass he indiscriminately held above us. Father Ramon shut the door behind him and walked down the aisle between the rows of pews. His plan was to smoke a cigarillo and have a strong black coffee before throwing together a plagiarized sermon. Just then he heard a curtain being drawn across the confessional booth at the far end of the altar. He paused and glanced over in the direction of the intrusive noise. The overhead lights weren't even on yet and most of the sanctum was still cast in dreary, cold shadow. Had the visiting priest arrived early and opened the side door to the public already? Perhaps with the intention of hearing an early morning confession. Hello. He called out, his cautious voice reverberating across the stained glass windows and vaulted ceilings. There came no response from within the confessional. He was about to shrug off the perceived intrusion and continue towards their sacristy when he detected the faintest hint of acrid smoke wafting through the still air. Was something on fire? He walked across the row of pews and approached the shrouded booth. Is someone smoking in there? He asked, not sure whether to be alarmed or upset. Didn't really smell much like tobacco at all, the more he considered it. It reminded him more of the harsh burn of rubber skidding across pavement, but whatever it was, it did seem to be originating from beyond the curtain. The drapery was pulled back half an inch, and he caught the glimpse of a figure, a man, kneeling within the booth, his face cast in shadow. Father, I must unburden my soul. A repentant voice emerged from within, muffled and haggard, as if crawling from deep under the earth. Father Castillo paused. He had no idea how the man had managed to enter the house of God without the Almighty seeming to notice. Perhaps the man had been hiding during the previous night when the doors were locked. He didn't like the possibilities that suggested about the stranger's character. Do you need help, friend? The priest asked, keeping his tone unthreatening and even. Only the Lord's forgiveness. Came the response from the hidden figure. Ramon straightened and made himself take a few calming breaths. The priest's section of the confessional booth had an actual door with a privacy lock. If the man was dangerous, he'd likely be safer within its confines than out in the open amongst the pews. Either way, best to get it over with quickly, not try his patience any further, although he wished he'd been given the opportunity to have coffee before he had to interact with someone seeking spiritual aid. He entered his designated area of the booth and closed the door behind him. Was it warmer inside than usual? He removed his jacket and took his seat without bothering to turn on the overhead light. From either side of the screen, the two would converse in darkness. Tell me, what is your name, my son? Marcus. What do you have to confess, Marcus? Father Castillo asked, trying his hardest to sound sincere. I killed a child. The man named Marcus responded with almost no hesitation. The flesh on the back of the priest's neck prickled, and for a moment he didn't know how to respond. After an uncomfortable pause that betrayed the priest's faltering composure, he made himself respond. Was it an accident? This child's death? No, father. The tone of the voice changed from timid and shameful bold and empowered, almost as though he was savoring a triumphant memory, and the temperature in the booth seemed to rise with every word the stranger uttered. I was returning home, intoxicated and callous, behind the wheel of my car. As I pulled onto my street, I struck the child on the crosswalk. He became trapped under my car and was dragged several yards. Father Castillo felt bile rise at the back of his throat, and he suddenly began to feel very lightheaded as the visions of that night, long since buried, threatened to overwhelm him. That sounds like it was accidental, then. The priest stammered defensively. No, Father. 
voice spoke with deathly certainty. It wasn't the collision that killed him. It was my actions after recognizing him. As he begged for aid, I removed my departed father's handgun from its hiding place in the trunk, wrapped it in a hand towel to silence the shot, and, knowing the boy's testimony would be the final straw that sent me to prison, I executed him. Sweat ran down Ramon Castillo's temples as he shook in terror, despite the sweltering heat. Memory of the boy's hazel eyes as he pointed the gun, making his heart twist. He stood quickly and attempted to exit the booth, but the latch had become searing hot, and his skin blistered as he cried out in pain. I buried the body under my shed, ran the car into a tree to cover the damage, and put the handgun in the desk drawer next to my Bible. The same desk I sat behind as I comforted the boy's mother after mass. There was a moment of agonizing silence. But what's even worse than my cowardice and my deceit was what I did with the body after I cleaned it, before the grave had even been dug. No, I denounce you. I have repented. Father Castillo nearly wept as he clawed at the walls, desperate to escape, knowing the Almighty's magnifying glass had finally found him. That was years ago. How could you possibly know this? What do you want? The screen melted off its frame and fell, smoldering into the priest's lap. But before he even began to acknowledge the pain, a pair of ominous glowing eyes met his gaze from the darkness across from him, red as though they were bleeding and eternal like the night sky. An arm shot through the partition and a demon hand encircled his throat, causing his skin to blacken and wither. I am your final sunrise, the man named Marcus declared. And I wish to show you a new kind of fire. July 17th, 2016. The lock on the motel room door had been broken when she arrived. Instead of requesting that it be repaired or that she be provided with a different room, she'd done something more prudent and daring. She'd fixed it herself and neglected to tell anyone. Now, that bit of defiance in the act of constructed vandalism had brought her valuable time as she opened the bathroom window around the back of the building and hurled her overnight bag out. The manager had attempted to walk in on her despite it being six in the morning, and when he found the door secure, began pummeling it with profanities and fists alike, demanding she open up immediately. Fortunately for her, she'd been awake and dressed for a half hour already, was in the process of making good her escape. Also fortunately, it seemed as though the man hadn't had the forethought to bring his keys, predicting easy access to her room and perhaps a glimpse of whatever she wore or didn't wear to bed. The little Scottish terrier barked his disapproval of the situation as she lowered him out onto the top of her overnight bag, clinging to his leash as she followed him. Legs first out of the window and into a maze of weeds and compost, nearly as unpleasant as the burly man accosting her door. The dog barked again as she attempted to lead him through an acrid puddle of stagnant swamp water, and her sneakers sank into the wet earth. Quiet, Cosmo! She hissed, though she doubted very much her pursuer could hear the dog's sharp protests over his own thunderous hammering. She'd foreseen this happening. The stolen credit card she'd presented at the front desk likely had enough funds attached to pass any kind of preliminary inspection, but after only a day it seemed to have been frozen and flagged. Kareen silently celebrated parking as far from the manager's office as possible as she opened her car door, threw her bag into the passenger footwell, deposited Cosmo into the front seat, and gunned the engine. The manager saw her as she backed her car over the grass median and floored it towards the parking lot exit. His gut bounced like gelatin as he made a half-hearted attempt to chase after her on foot. She was long gone before he could even make it to the vending machine. She sighed, 
the rush of her minor victory already collapsing under the weight of her larger situation. She'd hoped that she'd have more time to catch up on sleep and plan her next move after so much time on the road. Instead, it seemed she was destined for another few days of naps in her car, gas station coffee, and absolutely no place to shower. Living on the run was tricky, especially when she didn't know exactly what she was running from. Initially, when Marcus had informed her that she needed to leave town for a few days, she'd assumed he was being overly cautious and sentimental. He'd warned her that someone was after him, who may come to her for information on his whereabouts. Choosing to trust her world-weary neighbor's marine instincts, she'd decided to pack and head to her aunt's place on the beach for a few days. But after hearing that Marcus had killed himself, his wife and his wife's lover in a fire that had ended up consuming half of their apartment complex, she had immediately resolved to turn around and report their interaction to the local police. Torn between the relief that Marcus had likely asked her to leave to avoid her potentially being trapped in the blaze, and the immense guilt she felt for not sensing what he was preparing to do, her world had been rattled again almost immediately. Her other neighbor had called her to inform her a strange man had been asking around about her. After failing to get any satisfactory answers, he'd been seen letting himself into her partially decimated apartment in the middle of the night. The man had matched the description Marcus had given her as the one who tended to hurt people. It seemed Marcus may have been being more truthful than she'd initially suspected. The news had recalibrated the precariousness of the situation, and she decided to prioritize self-preservation over civic duty and adjust her level of caution from prudent to drastic. While going the notion to speak to law enforcement, She'd attempted to fall off the grid as best she could for a few weeks. She had abandoned her cell phone, emptied her bank account, and had even stolen a few credit cards. She stuck to the back roads and avoided more populated areas, where there would be security cameras at every street corner. She'd swiped the license plates off a truck up on cinder blocks behind a diner a few nights ago. She still intended to abandon her car altogether if the opportunity to acquire a new ride presented itself. She hadn't reached the point where she felt like she could threaten someone in a carjacking scenario, no matter what the circumstances. She wanted to remain safe, but she didn't want to become a criminal. Green was brought back to the present as Cosmo's cold nose poked at her arm. I know, boy. I'm hungry, too. We'll find some breakfast in a bit. She turned on the radio and was immediately bombarded with coverage of the Republican National Convention from the night before. She'd been out of the loop regarding the upcoming election for a short while and was floored to hear who had been selected as the nominee. What kind of bizarre world was she living in all of a sudden? Hmm, maybe my apartment burning down and being pursued by a psycho shouldn't be my biggest concern after all. She rolled her eyes and turned the radio off. Cosmo tilted his head sideways at her, as if obtaining food superseded all else right then. After an hour, she stopped at a gas station to top off her tank and check her oil. After purchasing a snack for herself and her beleaguered pup, with what little cash she had left, she was making her way back to her car when she noticed a Louisiana state trooper pull into the lot. She deliberately averted her gaze, but felt her pace quicken. She hoped whoever the badge was, he hadn't received a notification about a disgruntled motel manager a couple of towns over. Quickly lowering herself into the driver's seat, she discreetly glanced into the rearview mirror as she closed her door. The car's occupant hadn't exited his cruiser and was casually staring in her direction behind his dark glasses. Act casual, Cosmo. He's checking our plate. She muttered to her co-pilot as she turned the key in the ignition. Reaching into the back seat, she retrieved her dog's leash and attached it to his collar wrapping the other end around the passenger side overhead hand grip. In case they did get stopped, she was instructed to exit the vehicle. The last thing she wanted was for Cosmo to attempt to follow her and run loose along the highway. Putting the car into gear, she pulled out of her parking space and made to nonchalantly re-enter the flow of traffic, comfortably aware that the officer was still looking her way. As soon as she navigated herself back onto the highway, 
the cruiser's roof lights blazed into life, though the wail of the siren didn't accompany them. Corrine floored it, desperate to believe that those lights weren't about her, knowing in her gut that choosing to stop and refuel so soon after the motel had been careless of her. Now she was likely going to be the first person ever arrested for repairing a motel room door. Cosmo remained indifferent to the whole situation, rummaging around in the snack bag looking for treats, seemingly unbothered by their sudden extreme change in speed. In almost no time at all, the cruiser was directly behind her, lights flashing like targeted attacks, still closing in as silent as a shark. Green bit her lip. There was no chance of her outrunning him, so she decided to take a calculated risk and pull her car over. She rationalized that leading the cops on a high-speed chase would land her in far more trouble than whatever she was already in. She brought her car to a compliant stop on the right-hand side of the highway, put herself in park, and rested her hands on the wheel. Cosmo, look at me. She stared at her pet, authority in her voice. Do not try to bite this guy. Just do what you do best. Sit there and look adorable and dumb, and let's hope this guy is a dog lover. The cop sat in his car for a long moment before lazily extricating himself from inside the shell of his department-issued chariot and sauntered over to her driver's window. His sunglasses were still on, and the haughty drawl of his accent left no question in her mind as to how this guy lightly felt about the previous night's convention. Morning. The officer let the word escape from his lips slowly, drawn out like a string of mucus. I'm Officer Nathaniel Dixon, and your plates belong to a 2001 Ford Ranger. Green didn't respond to his non-question, which also wasn't quite an accusation. She just concentrated on keeping her face locked in a neutral position and stared at her reflection in the shine of his glasses. You have your license and registration with you? He asked as though bored, giving the back seat a quick glance through the window. No. Corrine said coolly, but not rudely. And the car isn't mine, but I didn't steal it. It belongs to my ex, and he's locked up. It was partially true. The car had initially been purchased in her ex's name, with her listed as the secondary. When he defaulted on the payments, he'd surrendered the car to her. After they'd broken up, they'd fallen out of contact. The well, last she had heard of him, he'd been arrested after a particularly brutal bar fight where the barkeep had lost an incisor. She had no idea if he'd been sentenced, but the point was, he was an easy scapegoat to use as she feigned ignorance. So you're saying, when he got locked up, your license and registration were in his back pocket? Officer Dixon replied sarcastically. My license is still in the pair of pants I was wearing the last time he hit me and tore him off. She tried. And this part was a lie, but it fit the narrative. Straining to keep her poker face intact, she stared back into the man's lenses and forced herself to commit. Dixon's expression didn't soften. If anything, her words seemed to amuse him. The faintest trace of a smirk curled up the side of his face like a weed. X's name and personal info? He asked in a tone that was almost a cackle. She gave it without hesitation or protest, while the cop jotted down notes in his pad. When he asked for hers next, she gave the name of an attorney's daughter she knew from up north who looked a bit like her, hoping if he ran the name it may encourage him to proceed with kid gloves, unless he saw through her ruse immediately. Again, calculated risk. So you're implying you weren't aware that the plates were stolen? I'm implying I don't really care. You can take the plates and impound the car if you need to. I'll just hitch. <laughs> what if I told you these plates on this car were only reported stolen a few days ago? From only a few towns over at that... And what if I also told you that a young woman with a stolen credit card matching your description hauled ass out of the weary travel motel in a vehicle identical to this one a little over an hour ago. He leaned in closer to her, his breath suggesting there was likely a flask hidden under the seat of his cruiser. How would you respond 
then. I'd say that's a terrible name for a motel. She shrugged. Nathaniel Dixon chuckled before taking it upon himself to unlock her car using the switch on her doorframe and then wrenching it open harder than he needed to. (coughs) Cosmo barked his opposition to the man's unprofessionalism. Get the fuck out, he hissed. Green took a deep breath and unbuckled her seatbelt. She knew the difference between cops who would only put their hands on you if they had to, and the ones who very much wanted to. This one was definitely the latter, and she thought it best to comply so as not to give him an excuse. After she stood up, she closed the car door behind her and set her hands on the roof of the car without prompting. Dixon immediately began running his hands up and down her sides, in theory to search her for weapons even though he hadn't asked her beforehand if she was carrying any. Listen, Missy. His face was so close to hers, his voice seemed to invade her ears like a centipede crawling into its hole. We both know you're lying through your teeth. Maybe you are running from your ex-boyfriend. Maybe you're not. But you're definitely running from something. And in doing so, you're making waves. Normally, I wouldn't care. But now you've made it my problem. That frustrates me. He ran his hands up under her shirt and then down the back of her pants, between her skin and underclothes. I didn't become a cop for this minor infraction bullshit. Taking you in would be more trouble than it's worth. So I'm going to say this once. Keep driving until this state is outside the time zone. Because if I see you again, I'll definitely be putting you in cuffs but I won't be transporting you anywhere. Get the picture? He pressed her face down into the roof of her car as he dug his hand deeper down into her shorts and felt up her inner thigh with unflinching, perverse relish, completely unbothered by the passing traffic. Kareen shivered with white-hot rage, suppressing the overwhelming urge to spin around and bite down into his face like a feral beast. I got it! She snapped. He let her go, pulling the handful of cash she'd received as change from the gas station out of her pocket. And please remember, if you choose to file a complaint, my name is Officer Nathaniel Buford Dixon. Make sure to wear something sexy in court. He tilted his head forward as he counted the bills, and for the first time Corinne noticed the scarring around one of his eyes behind the frames. Quickly getting back into the car, She slammed the door and floored it before the man could grab at her again. She was so livid she nearly considered backing up and running him over with her car, but she knew as far as the bigger picture was concerned, she was in the clear. The cop didn't know her real name and didn't have the car's real plate number. He had her ex's info, but she very much doubted that he would follow up on it. Even if he did, her ex had no way of knowing where she was going. As far as the mysterious man who Marcus had warned her about was concerned, she was still in the wind. She allowed herself the faintest of smirks as Cosmo, seeming to sense her distress, began licking at her hand. Based on the injured eye the man had so carefully tried to hide, it looked like someone had put the bastard in his place at some point. Probably another woman he'd tried to touch. Wherever that woman was, at that moment, she was Corrine's fucking hero. Nixon pressed his fingers under his nose and inhaled deeply as he returned to his throne back inside the patrol car. He smirked at the hint of moisture he thought he could detect on his fingertips. That back-talking harlot had enjoyed it. His radio burped into life as dispatch questioned him as to the status of his roadside stop. Irritated at the interruption, he unhooked the handset from the dash and pressed the button to respond. All's well. He strained to keep his voice professional. It wasn't the suspect from the motel. Tell Carl to stop clogging your phone lines with inconsequential bullshit. Whoever that woman was, she's long gone by now. He replaced the handset without another word. Taking a carefully portioned swig from his flask, he was about to turn the car around and head back the way he'd come when he paused. Pulling his cell phone from the glove compartment, 
he placed a call and reclined his seat a fraction of an inch. After two rings, a slightly flustered, very brusque voice inquired. Manetto. Howdy, Gemma. It's Nate. What do you want, Dixon? You remember that discreet APB you put out a few weeks ago on that soldier? After he escaped from the hospital, he reported he may be in the company of a woman and a dog. What kind of dog was it? He heard the woman shifting through papers. White Scottish Terrier. I'm pretty sure. I just found her. Dixon ran his tongue over his teeth in amusement. He gave the young woman's description to his contact, including what he'd noticed about the car and the dog. The names don't match, but I'm convinced she was lying anyway. No severely burned soldier with her, though she was sure in a hurry to get away from something. You didn't arrest her? Negative. I could have for petty theft, but she would have been out by supper time. <sighs> doesn't matter. She's not the target, and I doubt she knows where Marcus is. I never really believed they were traveling together anyway. I know you don't value my input, Special Agent Manado, but I really think in this case you're just Jackie Kennedy chasing brain matter. This rogue soldier you're looking for is almost definitely deceased. And even if he isn't, no way you're going to find him on your own without agency help. Personal vendettas don't often yield rich harvests. <laughs> Says the man still hunting for the bounty hunter who scarred him. I appreciate the information, and I'll deposit the usual sum into your account. But I promise, your opinion means less to me than a spa date in a septic tank. Well, I know how fond you are about getting up close and personal with little shitholes, special agent. Fuck you very much. Dixon snarled back at her and was about to disconnect when a male voice came on the line. Its owner was unknown to him, and the intensity behind his almost otherworldly calm made his stomach flip uncomfortably. Nathaniel Dixon, I know you put your hands on that young woman during the traffic stop. Every vulgarity you utter and perversion you engage in are being tallied, and before long you will be required to answer for them. Speak to Miss Manetto in such a manner again and I will prioritize accompanying you personally to that final judgment. Dixon nearly roared back into the phone that he wasn't afraid of whatever internal affairs investigation Manetto or anybody else had opened on him. But his words caught in his throat. His body camera hadn't been on during his interaction with that woman. Neither had his microphone. How could this mysterious stranger possibly know about him putting his hands on her? Had the young woman called whoever this was immediately after? Who is this? He demanded, hoping he sounded fierce, but knowing he more likely sounded unnerved. Think on your sins. There are no second chances beyond the grave. The line disconnected. In a rented office several states away, disgraced former ATF agent Gemma Manetto tossed her cell phone aside and stared up at the two men standing on the far side of her obscenely cluttered desk. What in the hell was that? I thought you never spoke. She glowered at the taller of the two, pale as a marble statue and just as expressive. The man turned and retrieved his leather jacket from the coat rack before exiting the room without muttering a word. Unfazed by the man's lack of candor, Manetto turned to the second man. I don't need his help handling Dixon or anyone else for that matter. He needs to learn about boundaries. She huffed indignantly, not entirely convinced the pale man was out of earshot. The second man gave an unconcerned shrug and continued scooping his lunch out of the paper carton with his chopsticks. Despite his disheveled, almost reckless demeanor, unkempt red hair and defiant prickly stubble, this half of the pair was much easier for Manetto to relate to. You have to understand, Virgil is very much used to being in the know. The idea of privacy and professional pride are completely foreign to him. Try not to take it personally. Manetto absent-mindedly ran her fingers through her short, mousy hair before catching a glimpse of her visibly haggard self in the mirror. 
She had an enormous purple birthmark splattered across her neck that always gave the appearance that her throat had been sliced and she was bleeding out. Even after a lifetime of living with it, there was always that split-second moment of panic whenever she saw her reflection when she thought she was dying. Whatever kind of beauty she could have had that wasn't undone by the blood of discoloured tissue on her throat had been rotted away over time by her insecurities and constant episodes of self-loathing. Digging through her purse for anti-anxiety meds, she desperately sought to change the subject. How exactly did you two meet again? He saved my life, pulled me out of an especially deep, dark place. The woman snorted at his deliberate vagueness. <laughs> Look, Dante, I appreciate that there's a history between you two that I'll likely never understand. I also appreciate you being the only one to stand by me since I lost my badge. But as much as I hate Dixon's guts, he's probably right. Marcus is almost certainly dead. Dante shook his head slowly, as if in reluctant sorrow. He's not. How can you possibly know that? Because if he was dead, there'd be one less star in the night sky. Instead, it's the other stars that are fading. Minetto snorted and massaged her temple. Ugh. Oh, for fuck's sake. I'm never going to get my badge back. I don't know what I was thinking, agreeing to partner myself with you two. Dante stood and pushed in his chair. Are we any worse than the other men that you choose to ally yourself with? Like this Officer Dixon? Ugh, don't do that. Dixon repulses me, but at least I understand him. And to locate a man like Marcus, I need informants who can maintain an orbit around the black holes. You and your albino friend acting all clairvoyant and fearless won't produce results nearly as well as one scumbag willing to sink into the swamp. I understand his usefulness, but make sure not to glorify a man for successfully wielding his vices like a hammer against a nail, especially when, more often than not, that hammer is bludgeoning an innocent. Gemma Manetto poured another energy drink directly into her cold coffee. Sure thing, Dante. She conceded in mock appreciation and held up her mug as if to toast him. And the girl is not the target, but she's the only lead we have. Virgil and I are going to find her. Moneto gave him an exasperated look. Ugh, there is absolutely no evidence that she has been in contact with Marcus since the night of the fire. It's highly unlikely she'll be able to lead you to him. Probably not, but she's the only person from his inner circle who's still alive. Maybe he'll come looking for her. The man removed a crucifix on a chain from around his neck and set it down on the desk in front of her. In the meantime, leave your cell phone on and keep this in your pocket. The woman held up the silver trinket and raised an eyebrow. Why? Will it keep me safe? Dante smirked at her as he fastened his gun belt around his waist and tapped the holstered weapon with his hand. <laughs> Not in the way this will. But it will attract some good angels. Their presence will bring you a sense of comfort and inner peace. Don't you need angels more than me if you're off to fight demons? Dante's wily smirk spread into a full grin that reeked of poetic irony. <laughs> I've already got one. The arched gate to the cemetery was designed to look like a set of angelic wings. Virgil hated them, like so many other shallow human creations on this miserable plane of existence. It reeked of false sincerity. Something meant to represent the grandeur of the Eternals reduced to flakes of rust after years of indifference and neglect. Mortals were embarrassingly short-sighted, full of praise but weak of will. Small wonder so many of them were lost to the abyss. After forcing the gates open with an ear-splitting wail, he marched across the ill-manicured lawn to a headstone bearing the name Filippo Argenti. Grasping it firmly on either side with his bare hands, he wrenched it from the earth like he was removing a dead tooth and extracted one end of a chain hidden in the indentation beneath the mark. That was where Dante found him as the pale man continued pulling at the chain until it yielded a steel casket from deep within the earth. 
Dante chuckled as he watched his collaborator break the seal on the coffin and open the lid. Knowing full well, it would have taken ten men and a bulldozer several hours to exhume that box. Tired of idling? The red-haired man asked as he approached. The rain had started to fall gently, with all the signs of a more aggressive storm approaching on the horizon. Dante noticed while Virgil's clothing showed signs of dampness as the rain began to intensify, his hair and flesh were still bone dry. The weak and uncertain idle and await salvation. The wise choose to earn theirs. The pale man responded. He removed his broadsword from within the casket, along with numerous handguns and other holy weapons that dated as far back as the First Crusade. He shifted the Spear of Destiny that the two of them had located in the desert, the inhuman skull still impaled upon its tip, and removed a wooden stake about the size of a screwdriver and slid it into his boot. Dante recognized it as the largest remaining piece of the true cross. He hadn't even been aware that Virgil managed to free it from its prison under the Vatican. I told Minetto we're going hunting. If your hunch about Marcus no longer being tethered to either the saved or the damned is true, he's the closest thing to something like us we've ever faced. I thought we were the only anomalies. How do you banish a demon that hell doesn't claim? The damned have placed a claim on him. Virgil clarified as he slammed the casket lid shut. But unlike them, he doesn't have a preordained place in the underworld to return to. He didn't originate from there, so they can't simply retract the cord. Then where did he originate from? Dante asked, the full weight of this revelation starting to worry him. I don't know. He's the first unnamed demon to emerge since before Lucifer's rebellion and his actions suggest he's not adhering to any predetermined plan. He appears to be casting souls already destined for torment down into the pit. Demons usually target those who are mostly pure, ones they can corrupt, whose salvations are still in question. So he's not acting in accordance to either side, kind of like us. The difference is, even though we've been disavowed, we have no intention of usurping anyone. Virgil stared upwards into the heavens, as if he could see whatever lay beyond the suffocating layer of dark clouds. The last Eternal who attempted to act independently like this was trying to prove something. What was that? That he could be his own god. Safely hidden beneath the anonymity of his white hood, the young man grinned wickedly as his brethren gathered around the bonfire to hear the good word proclaimed by their incorruptible leader. He promised that the signs were clear. A new age was upon them, and the unwavering principles of birthright and the master race they all chose to live by would soon become common practice again. There was no mistaking it. They were about to re-emerge stronger than ever. What a glorious time it was to be alive. The young man watched as the Grand Master indicated that the giant wooden cross be set ablaze. He began to preach from the Old Testament as several men carried the massive structure closer to the flame. I fucking love fire. The young man slurred as he elbowed the silent man standing beside him. I used to burn animals alive as a kid. I burned most politicians too if I could. And their families. They don't deserve this country. The man remained silent beneath his white robes. You knew here? The young man tried to initiate a conversation again, hoping to hear his sentiments acknowledged and reciprocated. You sure ain't said much? I've been here longer than any of you. The man stated as the cross finally began to ignite. And I'll be here long after. Huh? The young man uttered stupidly confused at the sudden intense smell of sulfur and burnt meat clawing its way up under his hood and invading his senses. The man turned to face him. You see, I burn things as well. His arm shot out and grabbed a chunk of flesh behind the young man's left ear. Digging his claws into the soft flesh where the base of the skull met the neck, he tore the mask away, bringing with it most of the skin from the man's face. 
Blood cascaded down his white robes as he screamed in unfathomable agony. But before his brethren could fully comprehend what had happened, the silent man's clothing burst into flame, and he sprang upon them, tearing out throats with his teeth, gouging out eyes with his claws, and setting them ablaze to writhe and burn, dying slowly, completely unaware of what they'd summoned. One man managed to fire off two rounds with his shotgun, but Marcus flew at him with incalculable speed. The buckshot unable to harm him, even if it had made contact. He plunged the weapon's barrel down the man's throat, shattering teeth and rupturing the windpipe before incinerating him. The Grand Master attempted to run, abandoning his flock, but shadowy demon hands erupted from the tainted earth below and held him in place by his legs as their messiah, robed in blood-red flame, stalked the unholy arbiter of the gathering. Good work, boys. Marcus acknowledged the creatures below. He rammed his fist through the man's chest and wrenched out the still beating heart. Not one of you thought to bow to me. Such unworthy disciples. The clan leader's final moments were spent choking on his own heart. As Marcus roared with laughter and set him ablaze as well. The former man turned fiery deity, spread his arms wide and laughed as the trees surrounding the clearing all began to burn. The earth was scorched, every body mutilated and unrecognizable, and the stench of death being seized by the wind to be distributed for miles like acid rain. The young man who had spoken first wept from the only eye he had left as he clung to his obliterated face. Marcus approached him slowly, walking with great meaningful strides, like a conqueror, through the wreckage of the former regime. He was about to set the man alight when he paused. This man had something contained within his mind, a recent memory involving someone who was known to the mortal man Marcus had once been. The name Kareen echoed through his mind, and Marcus felt the faintest hint of anticipation and remorse for the first time since he'd shared his earthly bond. He probed the young man's mind and discovered he'd once been her lover, and what's more, had been questioned about her earlier that very day by the Louisiana State Police. Something about a car. Kareen. He felt the stirrings of an obligation unfulfilled. While bound to no morality other than his own, a feeling that could almost be described as longing had settled into his disturbed subconscious, and he knew he had a duty to himself to find this woman. Confronting her could be what finally determined the fate of the last remnants of humanity he was still carrying. He grabbed the man by his collar and lifted him into the air. We all love fire down below. Searing crimson flames erupted from Marcus's throat as he bit down into the young man's skull. Part 2 The forest was burning, its heat casting a crimson glow upon the shimmering night sky almost giving the impression that the heavens were bleeding. As the small child stood on her front porch, she clung tightly to her stuffed koala as she watched over a dozen firefighters across the street begin to empty out of their trucks, the wail of the sirens making her teeth vibrate. Her parents had told her to wait right there as they gathered the last of their essentials, preparing to evacuate the area lest the blaze overtake their home like waves upon the sand. As the child fidgeted, watching the first responders set up a perimeter. She almost didn't notice the towering figure emerge from the shadows amongst the trees. The stranger stomped across the pavement with long, vicious strides, approaching her home as though intent on confrontation. At first she assumed it to be just another fireman, but when she caught sight of his glowing red eyes and the scorched, blackened footprints left upon the concrete, her stomach sank, and she took a terrified step backwards. The red-eyed man marched across the grass, leaving smoking craters in the topsoil, and seemed ready to climb the steps to where she cowered, when he paused and knelt upon one knee. Running his fingers through the earth of her mother's flowerbed, 
He extracted a handful of ash where she knew they'd recently buried the cremated remains of her deceased grandfather. The shadowy man raised the ashes to his mouth and gently blew upon them, creating a soft orange glow of newborn embers. After giving the blaze a few moments to breathe, he carefully returned it to the earth like a parent would set a babe in a cradle. Raising himself back to his full height, he stared at the child with fiery eyes, seeming to stare through her, past the precious memories stored within her mind, the tender emotions residing deep inside her heart, and directly into the wispy semblance of morality forming on the blank slate of her soul. Pray I forget your face. When he spoke, tendrils of smoke spilled out from between his teeth. Turning away from her, he marched across the lawn and picked up her father's chainsaw where it sat in the bed of his work truck. Before she could comprehend why he would need such a thing, his malicious, booming laughter assaulted her like the rumbling of a volcano threatening to erupt. pressed her hands to her ears and closed her eyes tight, refusing to look up again until her parents were there beside her, gently gathering her up as they made their way to the car to evacuate. By then, the fiery man was gone. She was so badly shaken she couldn't find the words to explain to her parents the horror of what had just transpired moments before. As they backed out of the driveway, None of them noticed the thin wisp of smoke that was rising from the spot in the garden where the nightmarish creature had knelt, or that one of the fire engines had suddenly disappeared. Well, I guess now it's just a matter of time before one of us eats the other. Green glanced down at her pup with a sad smirk right before she slammed the hood on her car's smoking engine. Cosmo looked up at her with a calm, optimistic face seemingly undaunted by the severity of their situation. Since having the last of her cash stolen during their traffic stop the previous day, Karina hadn't seen the point in stopping her car until the tank was dry. After a brief pause under a highway overpass to discreetly wash every inch of her body where Dixon had touched her with sanitizing wipes, she taxed the engine until it had overheated to the point of a meltdown, committing a very loud, metallic ritual suicide before she could finish burning the fume. No phone, no cash, no food, no problem. Kareen chuckled to herself as she slung her backpack over her shoulder and gently tugged on Cosmo's leash to get him to follow. Come on, boy. Let's hope if my thumb can't get anyone to stop, my ass will. The dog pattered along obediently by her side as she flipped open the map with one hand and awkwardly attempted to pinpoint her location. While it was possible a good Samaritan would stop to offer them a ride, she wasn't willing to bet on it, and was determined to have an alternative plan in case the grey sky overhead decided to lift its leg and piss on her. Okay, looks like there's an RV park of some kind a few miles away. Let's make for that. Maybe we'll find a place to lay low for a while. She kept her tone upbeat and hopeful for the sake of the dog, but on the inside she was suddenly very afraid. If she was still in danger, she had no idea where she could go that would be safe, or if anyone she encountered could be trusted. On the other hand, if the threat was gone, so were all her resources. There was no way to return to the life she once had. Green bit her lip in a moment of harsh self-reflection and spoke to her dog again. Well, my life wasn't exactly a Fortune 500 company anyway. In fact, it was pretty much just like the car. Running on fumes with no destination. Cosmo woofed in agreement. Guess this is the kind of roundhouse kick to the head I needed to finally start taking my future seriously. Attempting to fold the map one-handed and avoid stepping on her dog, she almost didn't notice the shadowy figure watching her from the trees on the opposite side of the road. A cold chill sank into her gut but she forced herself not to break stride or stare in its direction. She kept walking like she hadn't noticed anything. If Cosmo sensed something, he seemed to be taking her lead. He had given no indication he was aware of another presence lurking nearby. For another ten minutes, Kareen continued to march on in silence, every half minute risking a quick glance across the divider to check and see if their stalker was keeping pace. 
which he was. Stirrings of genuine panic began to infect her thoughts. Whoever or whatever the thing was, it was drifting from tree to tree like a shadow, moving with such practiced stealth that it left no crunch of footsteps or rustle of undergrowth in its wake. It didn't seem large enough to be a man, but its movements were too precise and humanoid to be any type of forest animal. All she could make out in her periphery was a dark silhouette that refused to step out into the open and reveal itself, moving like smoke and matching her every footfall. She paused as if to readjust her backpack, the shadow paused with her. Too terrified to look directly at it for fear she may see a pair of predatory eyes staring back at her, she contemplated leaving the road and heading up into the trees to hide when the sound of an approaching engine caught her attention. Turning quickly, she pulled in the slack on Cosmo's leash and held out her thumb. An older man on a motorcycle with a sidecar attachment skidded to a halt beside her and gave her a brown-toothed grin. Is that your car back there, darling? Green gave a half-hearted nod, glancing over the man's shoulder, attempting to locate the phantom across the way, but it seemed to have dissolved back into the trees. It used to be. You need a lift? She glanced into the sidecar and nearly gagged in revulsion. Crammed deep into the footwell was the severed head of a buck, the antlers jutting out precariously like bars. The eyes were missing, and the tongue was hanging bloated and free from the mouth like a slimy tendril. Green felt a clash of panicked emotions erupt inside her mind. As much as she didn't want to trust this man, she was afraid of what may happen if he left her behind and the dark ghost reappeared. I don't think there's enough room, and even if there was, that smells like refried ass. Well, I know a place where you can shower after... He gave her a smirk that could poison a well, and she could almost hear the blood rushing down to his lower extremities over the sound of the engine. She was about to tell him to go suck his own scrotum when her blood froze. The shadow outline was back, and this time she saw the eyes. You have a helmet? The man removed the protective cap from his own head and handed it to her. She lifted up her dog and gave him a kiss on his tiny head before setting him in the sidecar trying the leash to the seatbelt. The pup whined, clearly unhappy about being there. Sorry, boy. Taking a moment to fasten the helmet strap tightly under her chin, she paused, as if about to change her mind, and then took a deep breath, as though fully committing to the choice. She looked him in the eye and smiled. Do you like Roadhead? Huh? She smashed her reinforced skull directly into the man's face, and she heard the nose crunch like a pine cone. Braying like a wounded camel, the man fell backward off the seat and hit the pavement, screaming profanities and clutching his face as blood stained his shirt like a watercolor painting. Green leapt aboard the bike, put it into gear, and floored it. The bike shot forward about five yards, and then she hit the brakes. Reaching over, she grabbed the buck's head by one of the antlers and tossed it out. The man was still on his back when she took off again, drowning out his anguished cries with the roar of the departing engine. She didn't look back to see if the dark spectre was following, afraid that if those pale, cold eyes found her again, they'd turn her insides to stone. Agent Gemma Manetto spun the cylinder of her revolver as she sat on the pull-out bed in the middle of her drab office. She remembered the bomb that had been hidden not so subtly in the child's sandbox at the daycare center. The way she'd tried to keep the teacher calm as she instructed her to have the children form a line and evacuate into the parking lot on the far side of the building. The way she'd second-guessed herself. Pointing the barrel of the gun into her chest, she squeezed the trigger. There was a sharp, intense snap of metal as the hammer fell, but no bullet was discharged. She spun the cylinder again and pressed the business end under her chin. Another squeeze, another snap. The bomb squad had been on its way. All she'd needed to do was clear the area and wait. She thought she had. 
when the teacher informed her there was a child missing, she'd returned to the playground to see a small boy playing alone under the slides. She'd just scooped him up in her arms when the explosion blinded her. At the hospital, they told her that she'd never regained consciousness after the blast, so she couldn't have remembered the crater, or the screams, or the sight of the child's smoking body. But she did. She remembered it all. Minato stood and walked across the room to the wall mirror. She looked at the splattered purple pattern the birthmark made across her neck and mocked cutting her throat with her finger. No relief there. But there was another way. She spun the cylinder again, put it to her temple and squeezed. It had taken her a full year to recover from her injuries. After being able to walk on her own again, she'd looked over the full report. She'd failed to properly secure the area. For some unknown reason, the boy had either missed or ignored the rest of the playgroup leaving. During countless dark nights in physical therapy, she'd begged the silence around her for the answer as to why she'd survived instead of the child. According to the file, she'd been dead when the paramedics reached her. After a few attempts, they'd managed to restart her heart, stabilize her, and get her into the ambulance. She cursed them for that, instead wishing that they'd dedicated their effort to the one lying beside her. Dante and Virgil had found her on the edge of the rooftop of her apartment building, contemplating the drop, and returned her to her home. Setting the gun down upon her nightstand, she picked up her cell phone and looked at the number she'd never had the courage to dial. She made to press the call button, changed her mind, and picked up the gun again. <sighs> The wish of some, the relief of many. Placing the mouth of the cannon back under her chin and squeezing the trigger. No sound followed. She glanced down at the weapon. The silver crucifix Dante had given her right before he left was hanging on a chain around her neck. When she'd placed the gun against her chest and pointed it upwards to aim under her head, the hammer had failed to fall because the hanging cross had jammed it. Disassembling the gun, she discovered that the one bullet in the cylinder she'd been betting her life with was lined up with the barrel. It would have been the shot that killed her, but the charm had prevented it. Shocked, exasperated, and more than a little spooked, she set the revolver back down. All right, fine, I'll call him. Retrieving her cell phone, she selected the number and pressed the call button, this time without any hesitation. After a few distant rings, a quiet voice came from the far end of the line. Good evening, ma'am. This is former agent Gemma Minetto. She paused to take a breath, hoping her newfound courage wouldn't abandon her. I was the one with your son when the bomb went off. I was the one who couldn't save him. Cosmo waddled across the parking lot enthusiastically clearly happy to be free from the loud metal animal that had been the borrowed motorcycle. Attached to the other end of his leash, an equally relieved Corrine let her dog lead her to the vending machines in the motel parking lot. Her pet seemed to recognize by now that those large upright boxes yielded treats if given attention. I'm not sure all this human food is good for you. She held her dog up to the window of the machine with a smirk, as if waiting for him to make his decision. Inside the deer-head man's seat, she'd found a hidden compartment with $40 in cash, just enough to keep her and her dog fed until they reached the state line and had to abandon the bike. Ugh, going to have to give you a bath soon. I don't think that was the first severed animal head he kept in there. Cosmo woofed his consent as she selected a sandwich and she set him back down on the sidewalk. After removing her purchase from the machine, she straightened back up and noticed in the reflection of the glass the red-haired man standing behind her. He was leaning against the railing of the stairs, hands in his pockets, staring directly at her. All right, Cosmo. Time to get back to the guys. She made sure her voice was loud enough for him to hear. Let's hope they're finished with their Krav Maga training. As she gently but firmly directed her dog to follow her, a second man suddenly appeared from the shadows in front of her. His hide and build reminded her of the Eiffel Tower. Elegant, towering, and sturdy. 
His hair was so blonde it was nearly white. Yet even that was a bit of a colour compared to the man's skin, which was pale white like the surface of the moon. Despite the sun being gone, he wore dark glasses that hid any warmth behind his eyes like an eclipse. Everything about the man's posture and appearance gave the impression of a concealed threat. Cosmo made an unhappy sound as Corrine reached in her pocket for the second thing she'd found hidden in the motorcycle. She pulled the snub-nosed revolver from its hiding place and pointed it at the pale man's face. From the angle she was standing, she couldn't tell whether the second man had moved any closer. Hello, Corrine. Hold it, Judge Doom. You and Roger Rabbit are going to take several large fucking steps back and let me walk away or else you get a JFK facelift. The pale man didn't react to her threat, and the fact that she couldn't see exactly where he was looking unnerved her. Your fortitude is commendable, but your judgement is clouded, and your reaction overzealous. We are searching for someone who is known to you. Tell me, Corinne, have you heard of the Burning Man? Her entire body tensed as she realised he must be referring to Marcus. What else could he have possibly meant? given how her old neighbour had destroyed half their apartment complex with fire. This was probably the man who Marcus had warned her about. She tried to stall for time. The longer they stood there, the more likely it was someone would see them. Either show me a badge or fuck off. My dog needs to eat. He is alive, Corin, Though he no longer exists as you knew him. She opened her mouth, but couldn't think of a response that would be equal parts denial, threat, and indifference. His words had shaken her, and she didn't know if her voice would hide the shock that suddenly gripped her. How could Marcus still be alive? The man behind her spoke for the first time. You know, Virgil, for someone who represents centuries of uniting people and spreading the good word, you aren't really much for tactful conversation. The red-haired man took a few careful steps forward and she tried to monitor him in her peripheral vision without taking her eyes off the pale man. Hi, Corrine. I'm Dante. And this is Virgil. Is there anything I can say that will get you to lower that? Sure. Tell me you're leaving. She glanced down at Cosmo and noticed him cautiously moving towards the red-haired man, his tiny nose twitching. That's when she realized he'd produced a dog treat from somewhere in his leather jacket. Cosmo, heal! The dog didn't listen and instead inhaled the treat like a furry black hole. Just breaking the ice, you two must be hungry. Dante said as he patted the pup's head gently. You hurt my dog, I will break you in half, rip out your spine, and read it out loud. Dante straightened up. The man you knew as Marcus has experienced a, let's say a transformation. He looks a bit different now, and you may not recognize him. Have you seen anything unusual lately? Green's eyelids fluttered, and she slowly lowered the gun. Unusual as in dark and ghostly? Maybe. Something was following me earlier today. Something shadowy, with pale eyes. Did you smell any smoke? Or brimstone? No. Then we have a problem. Why? Because that's what I smell right now. Virgil pulled off his glasses, revealing pitch black eyes. He's close. Kareen turned back to look at the taller man and noticed the dark pits under his brow. Whoa, what the- She raised the gun to his face while taking two frantic steps back. Are we doing this again? Dante gently took hold of Corrine's wrist and redirected the gun away from his partner. We've got to go. He began to lead her across the parking lot while Cosmo followed along, obediently behind. Get her to the van. Virgil stepped down off the sidewalk and drew his Desert Eagle handgun from underneath his trench coat, keeping watch while Dante escorted her to their armored transport. Corrine kept peering back over her shoulder at the pale man. What's wrong with his eyes? His father gave them to him. Dante slipped the revolver from her hand and disengaged the hammer, averting a potential misfire. I don't smell anything. Oh, you will. My senses are a bit enhanced when it comes to fiery entities. Dante opened the passenger side door 
scooped up Cosmo and placed the dog in Corrine's arms before helping her into the cab. This feels like a kidnapping. Kidnapping? That's a funny way to say rescue. Dante slammed the door and turned back to his partner. Virgil, let's go. The black-eyed man held his gun down by his leg, still as a stone, silent as a sundial. He's close. Okay, but we can't engage him here. There's too many people. If he's coming for the girl, we have to lure him away. Too late for that. From inside the cab, Corrine drew Cosmo up in her arms protectively. She glanced around the perimeter of the parking lot. That's when she noticed the shadowy form on the rooftop of the motel. Hey! She slapped the window to alert Dante and his friend. But before she could indicate where they needed to look, she smelled the brimstone. Let's at least form a perimeter around the van. As Dante pulled out his own handgun, two people attempted to exit their room and cross the parking lot, but he waved them back inside. Stay in your room. Lock the door. He turned as Corrine started slapping the van window. Virgil took half a step forward in response, and a fire engine plowed directly into him. Dante was nearly thrown off his feet by the intense rush of motion directly past him, and from inside the van, Kareen screamed. The cab of the fire truck was engulfed in flames, and from the driver's side, a blazing figure emerged, eyes searching, the heat from his boots scorching the pavement beneath him. Dante raised his weapon and unloaded the clip of the fiery entity. But to no avail, as the bullets seemed to evaporate upon impact. The red-haired man dropped his gun, pulled the cross he wore on his chain out from under his shirt, kissed it quickly, and drew a curved silver blade from his belt. The grip fastened in a crucifix shape to resemble Christ's final hour of suffering upon Calvary. Marcus, if you still answer to that name, this girl and this realm are under my protection. You have much to answer for. This realm was never yours to defend, cloth man. It's a desolate plain of withered wheat, where nothing of substance grows. I'm here to burn it all, to spite those who care for it. Marcus raised a bulky object in one hand, and with his other, wrenched the power cord attached to it. A chainsaw cut through the night, the blade a fiery orange color, the teeth shooting tongues of red magma into the air, as if he wielded a weaponized volcano. Dante bit his lip. Okay. Marcus launched himself forward and swung his shrieking blade at the man. Dante threw himself sideways as the chainsaw gouged a chunk out of the side of his armored van. The heat was so intense, his eyes watered, and his breath caught in his throat. Rolling underneath the van to the far side, he scrambled to his feet, wrenched open the driver's side door, and slapped a button on the dashboard. Water rained down from six hidden outlets upon the roof, shielding the entire outside of the van with a protective layer that Marcus could not break. It's holy water. Dante answered Corrine's unspoken question, and he climbed into the van and slammed the door turning the key in the ignition. What is that thing? Pissed off. Marcus snarled as he attempted to cut into the van again and prevent their escape, but the blessed water minimized the damage and weakened his flames. As Dante floored the gas pedal, Marcus was shot twice from behind. Virgil, his clothes blackened and charred, had dragged himself out from under the smoking fire engine and had raised his desert eagle. The gun smoldered like a forge hammer upon the anvil. Marcus spat an expletive and spun back towards the pale man, fiery red eyes meeting the inky black. Tossing his jacket and handgun to the side, Virgil revealed the broadsword he carried on his back. Wrenching the giant weapon free from its scabbard, he sprayed holy water across the blade from a flask he carried at his hip. He chanted in Latin as he approached the burning man. 
Pater Noster, qui es in celes, sanctificetur nomen tuum. Your hollow prayers will not strengthen you, favored son. I'm the only deity listening. There are no deities here. The blazing chainsaw connected with the broadsword. Dante drove the van a mile down the road and pulled over, Kareen clutching Cosmo so hard the dog was flailing his stubby legs in protest. Dante raised his hand to feel his face, wincing at the welts that were already forming on his neck and cheek thanks to the burns. Look, I need you to keep driving. In six miles there's a church, the parish of Francis D. Sales. Get inside and stay there. I'm going back to help Virgil. What? Isn't he dead? No way. He survived a lot worse than being crushed by a hellfire truck. Then why does he need your help? Because your friend Marcus may actually be worse than hellfire. Dante pulled a shotgun from a case behind the driver's seat and started loading rounds into it. Wait, that thing was Marcus? I'm afraid so. Is he after me? Not for much longer. And don't press any of those buttons. As Dante made to climb out of the cab, Corrine grabbed his arm. Wait! She pointed out the dashboard, the pale-eyed specter watching them from underneath the streetlight. Do you see that? Dante narrowed his eyes and paused. Wait here. He left the safety of the van and cocked the shotgun. Raising the silver Patriarch blade in front of him, he marched forward. Okay, we see you which means you want us to know that you're there. Identify yourself. The shadowy form seemed to shimmer a moment, like light reflecting on a pond surface, as if in response to him. Dante? Green shook in terror back inside the van. The man didn't respond as he took three more steps closer to the entity. Wait. I know you. Green screamed as the shotgun blasted and Dante was lifted into the air. Virgil and Marcus jeweled across the highway, the ear-splitting wail of metal on metal echoing for miles as their weapons connected. Every car in the motel parking lot was ablaze, and the building was being evacuated by the staff. Marcus spewed a fireball from his mouth, but Virgil deflected it with his blade, and it projected the flames into the night sky. He lowered the sword and stared back into the red eyes, searching for any trace of a soul. What is your true name? Certainly not Marcus. Who is the one who targeted him as a host? <laughs> the holy light no longer shines through you, favored son. Before long, you will fear me as you once did him. Virgil smiled. I've been burned by worse than you. Then I shall reopen your scars. Marcus charged the pale man, wielding the chainsaw like a reaper's scythe. Virgil raised the broadsword and caught the teeth of his opponent's weapon. Sparks flew in the air in every direction, setting the grass on either side of the roadway alight. Unable to crack the broadsword thanks to the holy water, Marcus attempted to cut the hands off his adversary's arms, but was unable to find an opening. Virgil spun, pivoting the giant blade with far more grace and skill than any mortal man could have managed. He swung the sword in a wide arc, intending to take off the head of his rival, but the burning man seemed to anticipate his every strike. What do you want with the woman? To kill her in front of you. From underneath the earth, several pairs of fiery hands grabbed Virgil around the ankles and held him in place. Until then, you will wait here and despair. Unable to move, Virgil clutched the sword blade and held it up in front of him like a staff. Marcus drove the chainsaw down with his full strength until Virgil's arms buckled and the sword slashed a gash across his face. The broadsword hit the pavement with a clatter, 
but before Marcus could deal a blow that would decapitate the Pearl Man, Virgil pulled the wooden stake from his boot and planted it in the burning man's throat. Despite being engulfed in unholy flame, the shard of the true cross would not burn. Marcus roared in pain and dropped his mechanized weapon. He struck Virgil's face so hard the man's head smashed against the concrete, shattering it like glass. The demonic hands encircled Virgil's prone form, preventing him from moving. Marcus heaved a labored breath and attempted to remove the wooden fragment from his neck. Every time he wrapped his hand around it, his fingers crumbled into ash, just to reform as he jerked his hand away. I shall return for you. Following the path Karina had taken in the van, it only took Marcus a few short minutes to close the distance. The van was abandoned in the center of the street. Neither the red-haired man nor Corrine were anywhere to be found. Marcus paused, a scent in the air he did not recognize. There was another entity in play, and it had reached her first. He threw his head back and roared. <laughs> Part 3 When she inhaled, all she could taste was soil and ash. Dante! <laughs> she attempted to cry out, but the word caught in her throat like a rusty nail. The world around her was the blackest of pitch, and all she could hear was the rushing of frenzied blood in her ears as her heart hammered against her ribs like a piston. Raising her arms shakily above her, Corrine realized she was lying on her back in soggy dirt, but the darkness encasing her wasn't merely the absence of sunlight, it was a crushing envelopment of stone and earth. She was underground. What had happened? Had she been buried alive? <laughs> Cosmo! She coughed, suddenly desperate to feel her dog's warm tongue against her hand to reassure her she wasn't completely alone lost forever in an immeasurable void that was neither life or death. In response to her cry, she heard the faintest of scuttling from somewhere in the darkness. It wasn't the sound a dog would make. It was the sound of something large raking the earth beneath its claws as it maneuvered its bulk on unsteady appendages in her direction. As much as she yearned for the faintest glimmer of light, she suddenly froze. Terrified such a glow would bring with it the eyes of the thing somewhere buried down here with her, with its claws not far behind. She bit down on her lip to prevent herself from screaming and clenched her hands into panicked fists. If this was how she died, she prayed it wouldn't take long. If she was already dead, well, then hell would take some getting used to. The armored truck sat idling in the middle of the highway doors open, engine running, barely noticed by the first responders who drove past it, sirens wailing, intent on getting to the fire that was engulfing the small roadside motel not far away. The first frantic 911 calls had spoken of a man burning alive while wielding a chainsaw, and a pale man attempting to kill him with what was described as a braveheart-sized medieval sword. Most of the emergency workers presumed the witnesses were observing a brawl between two very dangerous but two very ordinary men and the fire had warped their perception. They may have reconsidered that view if any of them had paused to question the pale man riding the motorcycle with sidecar attachment in the opposite direction with the headlights off. As Virgil hit the brakes and skidded to a stop behind the van, he pulled his broadsword from the sidecar and raised it with both hands, expecting a furious, fiery attack at any moment. Dante! He called hoarsely an inky black blood running down the side of his face from where Marcus had shattered the concrete using the pale man's skull as a wrecking ball. He examined the van carefully, checking inside, underneath, and all around it for any sign of his partner or the girl. After determining the van was undamaged, he threw his sword into the back compartment and opened the case behind the driver's seat. The shotgun was missing. Settling for a fully loaded Taurus Magnum revolver instead, he left the van and took a few careful steps into the shadows, gun up and ready, anticipating a target. Not long after Marcus had stunned him and left him immobilized thanks to the inhuman grip of his hidden minions, 
Virgil had felt their resolve weaken as somewhere their master grew distracted and irate. He was able to break free. Irate was good. That meant Marcus didn't have Dante and the girl. But if he hadn't managed to intercept them, where had they disappeared to? Taking another few steps, he noticed the missing shotgun upon the ground. Scooping it up nimbly, he checked the rounds and determined only one shell had been fired. Something else had been here. Something that neither himself nor Marcus had anticipated. As he turned and made his way back to the van, he paused and pointed the Taurus at something emerging from the woods. A small white dog, clearly traumatized and desperate to escape this particular slice of nowhere, padded over to him and stood shaking at his feet, whining pitifully. He lowered his handgun. This was the dog the girl Corrine had been with at the motel when they'd found her not half an hour ago. Well, what happened? He asked, not really expecting an answer. He was clairvoyant enough to feel the emotional turbulence from the echoes of the animal's recent memories, but not nearly well enough to draw any conclusions. Something had been here, waiting for them, and it had forcibly taken them, but if not to aid Marcus, then to what end? He picked up the dog and turned to deposit it in the back seat next to his scalding hot blade, then thought better of it and set it in the passenger seat instead. Climbed into the driver's seat and pulled the burner phone out of the glove compartment, calling the only number listed in the contacts. Yeah? Gemma Manetto's voice seemed stronger and calmer than the last time he'd heard it. I need backup. Dante and the girl were taken. There was a pause. Are they alive? Virgil said nothing. And after a heartbeat? Where am I meeting you? Can't say yet. Follow the van's tracker. Drive fast. That cross that Dante gave me. She said, her voice soft and uncertain. Impacted a certain decision you made. Another heartbeat. I'm on my way. Virgil hung up the phone. He looked over at Cosmo and recalled the spot in hell where he'd witnessed dog killers being tormented. If they only knew... Your kind would be more revered, he muttered as he put the van into drive and floored it down the dark highway. Cosmo didn't respond. The rain was just starting to fall as Charlotte took a seat on the front doorsteps for her 15-minute break. Setting her tub of stale popcorn to one side, she pulled out her phone and began scrolling idly through the meaningless jargon all adolescents her age sought to find some semblance of meaning in. Not that she couldn't have done so inside behind the counter had she chosen. It was a joke that the movie theatre was still open. The building was decaying around them, with mold growing under the auditorium seats and the projectors and screens so far out of date they couldn't screen anything remotely close to high definition, though they still advertised it. Barely pulling in enough revenue to keep the lights on, most of the staff had mentally checked out and only continued to work because they either lacked the ability or ambition to find another job. Absent-mindedly shoving the popcorn into her mouth, she glanced up as she heard a torrent of awful noise from somewhere deep in the trees across the parking lot. She wondered if some coyotes had gotten into a scrap with a black bear, though she doubted it. Whatever the mystery things were out there clawing at each other sounded much, much bigger. After a moment, her mind wandered as she popped in her earbuds to drown out the ruckus and found a pointless video to watch. She'd almost finished it when she glanced up, noticing a dark figure stomping out of the woods, dragging what could have been a rope or a belt behind it. Unable to see him very well as he kept to where the shadows enveloped him, she noticed that his clothing seemed to be releasing a thin haze of smoke. As he walked, it lingered in the air behind him like the misty tail of a phantom dragon. Were you in an accident or something? She called out, only half interested. She pulled out her earbuds and raised her phone to record the man as he paused and changed course, making his way towards her. Hey, you can't smoke inside the theater. She added, half joking, eyes still on him through her phone camera as he walked up to within a few feet of her. Oh, yuck! 
She gagged as the stench of burning meat enveloped her. She backed away as she felt the heat. Do you get gang raped by toxic wildfire? Charlotte raised her phone higher to get a better look at the man, his eyes two pinpoints of red in his sunken, dark face. Where's the cathedral? The smoking man asked in a sudden, hissing bark. When he spoke, more smoke escaped from between his black teeth. A what? Hold still. Charlotte took three pictures of him with her camera phone. The dark man leaned forward. In that temple of worship. Gross. Back up, dude. She said as she turned her phone back into video recorder mode. Do you mean that old monastery? They're tearing it down to make room for cell phone towers. It's back there in the woods. She pointed to an opening in the trees where a gravel road had been built to accommodate the demolition vehicles. The dark man turned in the direction she casually indicated. He looked back at her. When I return, you will burn, writhing in agony under my foot as I flay your smoking sinews from charred bones. Whoa, I just got that threat on camera, asshole. Charlotte spat defiantly as the man turned and made his way towards the path in the trees. She stood up and called after him, still recording until he was out of sight. My dad's a lawyer! We'll fuck you up if any of my clothes are ruined because of your putrid stench. She sat back down and muttered curses under her breath, then rewound the video to make sure it had all been recorded. It wasn't until her break was over and she had watched the video straight through for the fourth time that she noticed what she thought had been a belt the man was dragging actually looked more like the blackened spine of a human skeleton, with the broken skull gripped firmly in his withered hand. She wondered if the video would be flagged if she decided to post it on YouTube. Green was able to keep herself from screaming until she saw the eyes, although she couldn't exactly explain how. They seemed even darker than the pitch black of their surroundings. It was like the cavern they were trapped in was dark because of the absence of light, and those pits were where all the light was ensnared and killed. Her scream was raspy and weak, she attempted to scramble away as the thing let out a high-pitched wail, like the roar of a kind of demonic mountain cat. She cried out in desperation as she felt something cold and slimy wrapping around her ankle. The empty moor she assumed were eyes hovered above her and she felt a blast of freezing rancid air upon her face and neck that reminded her of bloated corpses. She was about to scream again when the creature was jolted back and away from her and the grip on her ankle was broken. She heard the rapid, piercing sound of what sounded like a knife through flesh and then a loud screech and a wet snap of something breaking that was definitely supposed to remain intact. The heavy thud sounded beside her as something with a bulk much bigger than her own hit the floor. Green shrieked as she scrambled backwards and slammed against the unforgiving bulk of the cavern's wall. Best not to shout so loud. We're close enough to the furnace to get burned. Dante? Green inhaled sharply, blindly reaching her arms out. Where are we? What was that thing? What thing? The one that I just killed? Or the one that grabbed us on the surface? The girl paused. Um... Both? Where are you? I'm here. She felt a calloused hand slick with sticky blood grab hers. She didn't even care. With nothing but infinite cold darkness surrounding her, any proffered hand, no matter how tainted, was a relief to acquire. We're in the vestibule. Or rather, the doorstep of the vestibule. Living beings can't venture beyond this point. This is the realm of the soul. We were sort of deposited here to suffocate to death before being escorted in, in a spiritual sense. That thing was sent here to, um, accelerate the process. Green heard a wet crunch as something fleshy was kicked. How, how did we get here? No, more importantly, how did we get out? Her voice shook. She was having a very difficult time holding back panicked tears. Back up on the road, 
Do you remember that shimmering figure you spotted? She sent us here. She could have killed us outright, but then there would have been no guarantee our souls would have ended up where she wanted them to go. It's safer to set a trap than to hunt with a single bullet. As far as how we leave, well, we can't. The best that we can hope for is that Virgil changes her mind and she summons us back. Dante, I can't be here. I don't even believe in that stuff. Whatever you and Marcus and Black Eyed Guy are involved in doesn't involve me. Please, I can't die down here in the dark. I just want my dog. <laughs> What someone believes or doesn't believe has never really mattered down here. You think you're afraid? Not nearly as much as I am. I've been here before. I know exactly what's waiting for us. I've seen thousands dragged in chains across the threshold, screaming that they didn't believe in this, or that they're sorry, or that they aren't supposed to be here. If you press your ear to the wall, you can hear them. All they ever do is scream, scream and burn, pleading for impossible things like mercy, forgiveness, salvation. But do you want to know the one thing no one ever screams down here? Green felt her tears pool in her lap as she squeezed Dante's hand, not sure if she feared the silence more than she feared his answer. After an agonizing moment, she asked, What does no one scream? I regret nothing. The doors of the fragile monastery were shattered inward as the fiery demon renegade leapt down off the ground floor into the pit that had once been the rectory's secret basement, where the bodies had been buried after they'd been defiled, where very different types of prayers had been invoked than those in the pews one story above. Was this one of yours? Marcus screamed into the darkness as he held up the horned skull of the creature he'd dragged behind him through the dirt, its misshapen spine rattling like a snake's tail. Any demon spawned from the Malbolge is no longer my equal. Challenge me yourself! He bellowed, his enraged voice echoing like a thunderclap that promises the coming of a remorseless black storm. The voice that responded seemed, in contrast, like smooth nectar poured from the lips of a golden serpent. If only the light bearer could see you now, Samael. As he challenged the old father's might, you seek to emulate his actions, unworthy though you have always been. A graceful feminine figure with piercing pale eyes crawled forward across the dirt between the shallow graves of the forgotten corpses like a centipede would scuttle across the husks of withered maggots. A shimmering form stood upright and elongated into what could almost be described as a woman, equally as alluring to the senses as she was revolting. Her reptilian skin was a sickly greenish grey, with four blackened horns rising from the crown of her head like skewers. Upon her swollen breasts, her nipples leaked pus from savage cuts and a fanged mouth, three times the size of the one above her chin, sat agape upon her navel, catching the poison droplets upon its tongue as they fell. From her back, four great scorpion legs sprouted, holding her monstrous body aloft as the priests had once done with the Ark of the Covenant centuries before. Lilith. <laughs> Marcus laughed and shattered the demon underling skull beneath his fingers. How desperate must a light bearer be to release you from between his jagged thighs? Does his failed reign require me to grovel in order to finally gain purchase on the mortal plane above? He wears his chains as ornaments, satisfied to pretend to rule below instead of having to serve above. As long as he has allowed his ants to burn. The demon known as Lilith took four massive scorpion-toed steps towards him, a soulless gaze unwavering, a soft voice hellish yet hypnotizing. He has no knowledge of your treachery, though the lost souls you continue to reap prematurely have not gone unnoticed. Surrender yourself to me and I shall allow you to torment the girl's soul as you find most pleasing, 
without the light bearer's oversight. I shall not serve either above or below. This mortal plane has sat dormant, unconquered, unmolested for too long. It is mine alone to set ablaze. Release the girl to me, and my perceived disloyalty will burden you no more. On the ground beneath Marcus's feet, dozens of mangled, demonic arms clawed their way above the surface, searching for a victim to ensnare, just as they'd done before upon the highway to Virgil, the favoured son. Lilith tossed her slimy wet hair and smiled for the first time since she'd revealed her true form. Just as it was written, Samael, I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Marcus roared in fury as the arms grabbed him, digging their claws into his burning flesh, dragging him downwards towards the abyss. Charlotte glanced up from her phone as she heard something wail in the direction of the monastery, and for the first time that evening she felt uneasy about sitting outside all alone. Her break had long since ended and she had no reason to still be sitting there, but her rebellious bitter attitude overpowered her discomfort. It wasn't like her absence had been noticed. Fuck Bill, the pompous bullfrog. She'd make him come out and find her if he wanted to keep pretending this place was worth the effort. Girl... Charlotte jumped and dropped her phone, overturning her popcorn bucket as she reflexively dove forward to rescue it. He was nearly as weird-looking as the previous guy. This one was just as tall but as pale as a stick of chalk with a lean frame that showcased an impressive compact muscle mass that reminded her of the handsome Olympic athletes of her wet dreams. If only his eyes weren't so dark. Where did the other man go? The pale man asked her bluntly. She noticed the massive handgun on his belt and the bruises on the side of his face. The one that smelled worse than dumpster meat? He went to the monastery, down that gravel path. She pointed across the lot towards the shadows. The pale man glanced in that direction before turning to look back at her. Go inside, lock the doors. Tell those inside to take shelter. Pray if you feel your voice will be heard. Tonight, no soul is protected from on high. Are you a black guy, kid? Charlotte asked, everything the power man had just instructed her to do flying completely over her head. Do I look like a kid? The man blinked humorlessly before making his way towards the path. Agent Gemma Manetto was still a good hour away from where Dante's van was broadcasting its location. Fucking Louisiana traffic. She hissed between clenched teeth she navigated her way through the late-night highway travellers, most of whom seemed indifferent to the efforts of her sad little car to pass them. Realising she wasn't going to have enough fuel to get to wherever she needed to go to provide backup for her partners, she pulled off the next exit and haphazardly swerved across three lanes of traffic to pull into the closest gas station. Not even bothering to turn off the car, she climbed out of the driver's seat and dug in her pockets until she found her credit card and inserted it into the reader. As she began to fuel her car, she adjusted the collar on her turtleneck sweater, rolling it up her neck to her chin to shield her against the sticky wet breeze when she dislodged the silver crucifix Dante had given her. It fell freely to tap against her chest, swinging from its chain that was fastened securely around her neck. The reminder of it being there seemed both an affront and a comfort to her, given how a few hours before it had literally prevented her from ending her life after she'd managed finally to work up the nerve. She leaned against her car, lifted up the cross in her fingers to examine it more closely, inspecting it for any warps or cracks that may have occurred when the gun hammer had fallen and trapped it, preventing the weapon from discharging. <laughs> Divine intervention or dumb luck. Maybe it doesn't matter which. For better or worse, I'm still here. She mumbled to herself. A voice came from her left side. Hey, can I bum a smoke? She turned to see a tall, disheveled man in an overcoat leaning against the hood of the car. He seemed nonchalant with his lazy drawl and unfocused gaze, but Manetto immediately felt her stomach coil into a cold knot as she recognized the face. 
Jasper Womack. She whispered, a low-level career criminal wanted in eight states, and more alarming, known for assaulting and robbing women on the side of the road. <laughs> Sorry? The man's tone shifted ever so slightly from casual to accusatory, though his eyes didn't flinch. Manetto glanced behind her quickly. A gun was in its holster on the passenger seat right next to her cell phone, and there was no one else within shouting distance. I don't smoke, Manetto said quickly, trying to locate the casual authority she'd used to polish her voice when she'd been an active ATF agent. Neither does my husband. He'll be back any minute. The man drew a handgun from his waistband. Nice try, but you definitely said something else. Something my mother used to call me. And you aren't her. He pointed the gun at her neck. For fuck's sake. Manetto hissed impatiently between her clenched teeth, and then her eyes darted over the man's shoulder in sudden surprise. Oh shit. Jasper Womack half turned to look behind him as Manetto dove sideways into the car and grabbed for her weapon. Fuck. Jasper snapped as he corrected his stance and trained his gun on her through the windshield. Manetto raised her weapon and fired a shot through the bottom of the holster at the exact moment Jasper pulled the trigger. Two separate bullet holes exploded into existence as the projectiles passed through the windshield in opposite directions. Manetto's bullet ricocheted off Jasper's gun, causing him to curse in pain as the weapon was knocked from his hand. Motherfucker! He spat furiously as he held his damaged wrist in his free hand. He leaned forward to peer through the damaged windshield. The woman inside wasn't moving, and there was a splatter of something red across her neck. He maneuvered himself around the hood to the driver's side door to go through the woman's pockets when he noticed the ATF badge on her hip. Oh, fucking great! He hissed in aggravated panic as he abandoned both the car and his gun and took off running down the street. The gas pump clicked automatically as the tank finished filling up. Manetto didn't move. Marcus tore the arms off of his former demonic foot soldiers like he was pulling weeds up by the roots. Their screams of agony were barely audible over the burning man's own furious bellows. Lilith attacked, spearing Marcus through the chest with one of her scorpion legs but the man spewed a fireball from deep within his blistered lungs, flames erupting all over her like magma upon a cold wasteland. The demon woman snarled, but did not scream. Marcus wrenched himself free and grabbed at a chain hanging from the rafters above. Wrenching it free with a mighty crack that shook the building's foundations, he spun the lump of stone and iron at the far end of the chain like a mace and smashed it directly into the putrid second mouth upon the woman's navel. Lilith was thrown backwards into the far wall, but before Marcus had a chance to draw the mace back by the chain, the fanged mouth crunched down on the makeshift weapon, splintering it to dust. Ah, you are but one of a thousand failed usurpers, Samael. Anyone cast down behind him into the pit is forever doomed to wallow in his shadow. Lilith shot forward at Marcus again a long serpent tongue puncturing through one of his flaming eyes and coiling down his neck between his ribs. You will never be all-powerful as long as you shackle yourself to a human soul. Marcus reached down his own throat and wrenched enough of Lilith's tongue free to bite down upon it and sever it, freeing him from her grip. Once the girl's soul is extinguished, any echoes of the human's former life will be lost and I will be the first to escape from this pit as my own master. And then you shall revere me as you once did him. Marcus grabbed two chunks of concrete from the building's foundation, tearing them away as easy as if they were wet clay, and charged at the demon woman, pummeling her face and chest with his reinforced fists like stone boxing gloves. Lilith wrapped her legs around Marcus's waist, and her fang's second mouth bit deep into his torso, attempting to break his spine and devour him. The lift buried her claws into his neck. <laughs> the only reverence you shall receive will be from the ash you choke upon as you burn upon his altar for all eternity. 
Marcus felt his back begin to fold backwards at an unnatural angle. He was losing his grip, slowly being pulled into the unholy maw that was Lilith's womb. Whore! He screamed as her scorpion legs pierced his shoulders and knees. Lilith intensified her hold on him, so close to breaking his back, staring down into his blazing eyes with her cold, pale ones. And then a broadsword impaled her directly between her swollen breasts. Lilith screamed in agony and fell backwards upon the dirt as the holy weapon paralyzed her. Marcus fell sideways to land on a shallow grave, his flames slowly starting to die as he fought to regain his feet. Virgil leapt down into the hole from the floor above and fired his magnum into Lilith's face and eyes until the gun was empty. You can drag him back to hell for all I care. But unless you want to explain to your dark overlord how you left his realm unsanctioned just to be scarred by a holy blade, I want Dante and the girl returned to this plane, alive. Lilith's mutilated face bled pus and black leeches crawled from her eye sockets as she laughed a pitiful little cackle that betrayed more fear than defiance. <laughs> Ever content to live amongst the animals, Virgil, once favoured son, shunned by both the starry heavens and the kingdom of fire, never again to be worthy of a place amongst the brethren? Better to live amongst the animals than live beneath their shit. Virgil climbed upon her chest and twisted the hilt of the broadsword. Lilith screamed in agony. No. Release them. There was a burst of dust and gravel, and Dante and Corrine were slowly clawing their way out of one of the shallow graves at the opposite side of the basement. Dante coughed hard as he pulled Corrine to her feet. <coughs> water! He gasped. Virgil tossed his flask of holy water to his friend. He drained half of it before handing the flask to Corrine. Drink fast. We have to go. Marcus stood. Flames slowly returned to life as he stared at Kareem. Virgil wrenched the broadsword out of Lilith's chest and stood between him and the girl, while Dante held the patriarch blade high, his curved dagger with the crucifix fastened at the hilt. Thanks. It was getting really hot down there. Fire's not out yet. Corrine? Marcus whispered slowly, and for the first time in a long while he spoke with a voice the girl recognized. Her old neighbor she'd playfully flirted with when she walked her dog, and the man who had warned her of danger when he could have just easily have abandoned her to save himself. Green set the empty flask down. Marcus? The flames receded, and the man she once knew stood before her. How? How can that be you? You died in the apartment fire. I... I thought I did too. Corrine, don't listen to a thing he says. Marcus is dead. This thing just hijacked his physical body and is leeching off what remains of his soul. I think when he died, you were the only thing he no longer hated about his life, so that your existence would be the only thing keeping this demon restrained. If you die, then the last of Marcus's humanity will be gone. Dante turned to Virgil as the man took a step back in Corrine's direction. If Marcus's soul is still in there, we can exorcise it and free it from the demon. Far too late for that. The portal to the vestibule is still open. They're coming. Marcus held out his hand to Corrine. Corrine, I'm alright. Please, don't let them take me. Who? Oh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> The girl shrieked as the mutilated form of Karen, Marcus's former wife, crawled from the same pit directly behind them. Her skin was a blackened shell and her eyes were runny blobs of bloody flesh. Tar-like blood and smoke belched from her mouth as she crawled forward towards Marcus. Hell hath been summoned. Lilith hissed in amusement as she slowly climbed back up to stand upon her scorpion leg. 
From all the shallow graves surrounding them, decomposing bodies began to spring forth, each blackened and charred, twisted into sharp fragments of their former selves. Dante and Virgil immediately began clearing a path with their blades, but most of them swarmed around Marcus, gripping him by the legs, beginning to devour him. Corrine, help me! Marcus screamed in panic. And suddenly, she was there, next to him. Wait! If it's really you, I can't let them take you back down there. Whatever they made you, you were once a good man. You were my friend! Thank you, Corrine. He gave a triumphant smile. Flames erupted all around Marcus as his skin was vaporized, and he once again became the Burning Man, obliterating all the corpses gathering beneath him. Your soul is mine! Green screamed as the sleeves of her shirt caught fire and she fell backwards into Dante's arms. Lilith sprung at Marcus, while Virgil leapt at both of them with the broadsword, Though to strike at which, Corrine had no idea. Dante held out the Patriarch Blade above her as Marcus fell upon them. Then, a gunshot rang out. A bullet crashed through Marcus's skeletal face and struck Corrine in the shoulder, splattering her blood upon him. Marcus wailed as the blood seemed to disorient him. Lilith's scorpion legs impaled Marcus as the fiery ground opened up and swallowed them both though not before Virgil's sword sang and Lilith's head flew through the air to splatter with a wet thud upon the dirt. Then, there was nothing but silence all around them. Ah, oh, fuck! Corrine gasped as Dante put a hand over her wound. You're okay. We're all okay. From above them on the ledge, Gemma Manetto stood eyes wide, her gun pointed down at the spot where Marcus had been. What in the rancid fuck did I just shoot at? She asked in utter disbelief. Virgil picked up Lilith's severed head by the hair. Something that couldn't be killed by a bullet, yet it saved us regardless. Oh, okay, good. Excuse me. Moneto turned and started vomiting into the corner. Corrine winced as Dante helped her up her shoulder bleeding and her arms burned. Where's my dog? That's where the bullet hit. Minetto pointed to the hole in her car seat that Jasper Womack's slug had made after it punctured the windshield. I felt the thing shoot right past my neck. I was out for a few seconds. Moron must have seen my birthmark and assumed it was blood all over my neck. She ran her hand across the organic stain upon her throat. Dante leaned in, and gave the woman a hug. I'm glad you're all right. Are you starting to feel like you still belong here with us? Like you still have something left to contribute? I'm leaning that way. I spoke to the kid's mother, Dante. The kid I couldn't save? She... Well... She didn't hate me like I thought she did. Dante bent forward and kissed the woman on the cheek, and tapped the crucifix necklace with his finger. I think you'll save the next one, Gemma, just like you saved us tonight. I called the local cops about Jasper Womack. If they can't divert the resources to catch him themselves, they'll send some bounty hunters after him. They'll catch him before long. She stared back at the ambulance where Corrine was being treated. What did I see down in that pit with you, Dante? What were those things? Dante put his hands in his pockets. <laughs> Do you really want to know? Gemma Minetto paused. Mm, no. Virgil climbed up into the ambulance where Corrine was cradling Cosmo as best she could with her bandaged arms. Her left arm was also in a sling. Ah, broken collarbone. Arms are a little scorched. Fortunately, the sleeves took the worst of it. Thanks for saving my dog. You're welcome. Virgil? W what happened to Marcus? He was dragged back down to where he belonged, or at least the demon occupying his body was. Can't say what happens to Marcus's soul. It may be trapped down there, but I have a theory. What's that? The reason your blood hurt him was because you had consumed holy water only a minute beforehand. That wouldn't have stopped him from harvesting your soul, especially if you surrendered it to him. 
but I think it was enough of a shock to break the demon's hold on him. If there was any good left in him that his soul harbored because of you, it may have escaped. You may not believe it, but your casual friendship with a troubled man may have been the difference between a second hell ravaging the earth. Sometimes just being a kind person is enough to tip the scales. Green was silent for a moment. I don't know what to think. Think what you choose to. We all have to walk our own path. You're not going to preach some higher calling to me? Preaching is for holy prophets or unholy manipulators. I'm neither. So, what are you then? An angel? Or were you? Virgil shrugged again. Angels have halos, Corinne. Right now, your future is more important than my past. I'm not a black-eyed kid, if that makes you feel better. Virgil patted Cosmo on the head. Your hospital bills will be taken care of. Once you are discharged, if you choose to, call Manetto. She'll find you and your dog a place to stay. Well, she kind of owes it to me for shooting me. Amen to that. Virgil stepped down out of the ambulance. Corrine called after him. Virgil, for now, I choose to believe in Dante and you. Thank you for saving me. Dante wrapped Lilith's head in a shroud before locking it in the van's floor safe. He sat down in the passenger seat of the armored van. How long can a demon as powerful as her maintain her form without a head? I guess we'll find out. Virgil turned the key in the ignition. Chances are she'll try her luck in getting it back before she lets her master notice her without it. Virgil tapped the broadsword's hilt as it lay sheathed between them. Of course, there's always the chance she'll lose something else. Hard to guess which outcome she'd be more fearful of. Dante yawned. Uh, at least we don't have to deal with Marcus ever again. And hey, thanks for rescuing me from that place for a second time. Let's not make a habit of it. The armored van made a U-turn and exited the movie theater parking lot. In front of the lonely house in the woods, the dirt shifted in the garden where a dead man's ashes lay. Smoke rose from a spot a young girl had watched in horror as a dark, towering man had heaved a fiery breath. The smoke grew denser as a flame sprung to life from the cold earth. The ashes shifted and a deep laugh rose from the man's final resting place. <laughs> So much yet to burn, burn, burn.